Welcome. I'm Christopher Hallis, Chair of AUA, your Chair. It's my great pleasure to open the 2012 AUA Annual Conference and Exhibition. We've got a terrific programme for you. Diverse programme. Events, activities, and they're going to provide you with opportunities to develop new knowledge, new thoughts, perceptions about the HE sector and beyond. You're going to have opportunities to renew and develop existing professional and personal networks and to extend those. We've got almost 700 delegates from the UK and around the world. We've got colleagues here from Abu Dhabi, Australia, Bahrain, Canada, China, Ghana, Japan, Nigeria, New Zealand, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, and South Africa. I think that's a great indicator of the strength of our international dimension. The international dimension of the AUA and our work. I'm confident that you're going to be using the opportunities that our 2012 annual conference provide to develop your own personal professional edge within an HE environment which is fast changing and becoming for all of us increasingly more challenging. Our conference this year is being held here in Manchester, the home of our national office. And it's a great pleasure for me to now invite Dame Professor Nancy Rothwell, President of the University of Manchester, to welcome us to the university. Thank you very much indeed, Christopher, and a very warm welcome from me to both the City of Manchester and to the University of Manchester. Particularly warm welcome to those of you who've travelled from overseas. One of the things I very much hope is that you will not only gain a lot from the conference, but that they give you a little bit of time to get out and enjoy the city, and there are many things here to enjoy. Uh, can I just apologise, had you been here last week, you would have been basking in glorious sunshine, of course. <laughs> Uh, I was uh, one day last week on the top of our tallest building behind here and there was a temperature recorder there at 24.3 degrees centigrade. So it's not true that it's always grey and raining in Manchester. It's also uh, often very sunny. So um, some of you will, will know a great deal about the city and about the university, just, just very briefly from me. We are both quite an old university with the first foundations in 1824 and also a very new university founded in 2004 because it's then eight years ago that the Victoria University of Manchester merged with the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology to make us one of the biggest universities in the United Kingdom. Um, at that time, I took on a position as Vice President for Research, and then I took over as uh, President and Vice Chancellor in the summer of 2010. Just to give you an idea of that scale, we have 40,000 students, 10,000 staff, and an estate valued at about three billion pounds. So it is a big university. It's also a very diverse university in many senses. We teach not quite everything, but many disciplines, ranging from French to philosophy, medicine, dentistry, electrical engineering, just about all of humanities, business, and so on. Uh, and it's also diverse in its students and its staff. We have more international students than any United Kingdom university for the first time exceeding 10,000 this year from all over the world. And that's something we particularly value because Manchester is also apparently the most diverse city in the United Kingdom. That's not necessarily in total number of inhabitants from outside the UK, but in the number of countries that they represent. And I see this as a wholly good thing to live in such uh, an interesting and colorful uh, university and city. There is no doubt that the higher education sector across the world, and certainly in the United Kingdom, is undergoing very significant change. Not least, uh, 
those of you here will appreciate uh, the uncertainties as the change in student fee funding starts to take place from this September. There's uncertainty about whether this will alter student choices, either about whether to go to university or not, or indeed about which subject they take. And one of the things that we're particularly concerned about at this university is that the changing funding regime does not deter students from less well-advantaged backgrounds, because that's something we consider particularly important, not least um, in the, this environment. There are many other changes, of course, not least the, the wider uh, economic changes, and uh, you have a fantastic plenary speaker who I think is going to be talking about exactly that, the changing and challenging world in which we live. I've been a great fan of Kate Aidy for many years. You will have all seen her uh, on your television screens um, around the world. Um, I, I read just recently um, a quote that she will know well, I'm sure, that if you're an, at an airport and you see Kate Aidy arriving, leave quickly, because it's probably the wrong place to be. Um, Kate has uh, diverse experiences from the Northeast, uh, and uh, we were just chatting about our university days when we both spent much of our time protesting, sitting in and demonstrating, and not doing as much work as we should be doing, so we have something in common there. She's going to be telling you uh, some of her thoughts and her experiences, building on some of her, her work in broadcasting about uh, changes and challenges, and I'm sure you're looking forward to hearing from her. I certainly am. Welcome, Kate. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm always rather daunted coming and uh, standing in front of people talking about professionalism. Uh, I have a job. Uh, it, it's always a matter of some diffidence when you say the word profession and journalism in the same sentence, particularly in these troubled times. My conclusion is that human beings are the most remarkable animals. They cope incredibly. And the worse that cir circumstances get, the better they do. I don't think we have enough confidence in ourselves these days. You'll be coping people. You have coping strategies. You have vast amount of resources. And that's what's made me enormously optimistic, very, very convinced that people rise to challenges and can tackle change. I think we undervalue ourselves. I think we feel, oh, people are always saying, oh, no, you need to go on a course, you need to do that. Oh, sure, it's going to be difficult. Come on. We are top dog in this wonderful world. In places like this, you learn more. You have the background of fantastic education and knowledge of complex societies. You've all probably traveled far more than even your parents' generation travel. You can see things on the media which bring the whole world into your living room as well. And we can get information now on a tiny tablet which medieval men with a vast library of personal books could not imagine. They would have had a tiny amount of information. What a fantastic position. So, my thought is challenge, change, you will rise to it. So, get on with it. Thank you. Well, as I've been listening to Kate present that interesting, enjoyable, amusing, exciting uh, presentation, I've been matching some of the things against our CPD uh, framework. <laughs> Everything is there. <laughs> and whenever I look now at the future in finding innovative solutions, I will always think of bonsoir. <laughs> we have time for a, a, a couple of questions. Thank you. Matthew Andrews from Oxford Brookes University. Um, I was uh, fascinated by what you were saying, as I'm sure everybody here was, and I was particularly trying to think of parallels with a general career in university administration. And, and one of them that struck me was, um, it sounded like you, you started your career without necessarily the intention to stay in it 
um, it, it sounded like a, a, a job that you started after university and it built and went on to, to greater things. And I think that's a common experience in university administration. Um, some of the other bits, much less common. So as much as I might have, <laughs> as much as I might have wanted to be in one of our uh, governor's meetings and have a grenade on me, um, <laughs> I've never yet done that. Um, so I'm particularly interested in, in hearing from you about when did you decide you were going to stay as a journalist? Was there just one turning point or did you look back and realize? It, it, it's, a, it's, a very, uh, it's a very good question in the sense that I never intended to be a journalist in the first instance. I joined local radio as a humble station assistant and um, catalogued the gramophone libraries, fed the station cat and occasionally invented the weather forecast. <laughs> invented it. Well, we couldn't afford the Met Office um, uh, information, so I used to just open the window and have a guess. Um, um, you would say, very good grounding for a journalist, probably. <laughs> Make it all up. Um, I never actually, I, I did actually change out of jobs. I was working in a big organization, which gave you opportunity, uh, and you could see into it when you're in a big organization, that there are lots of different kinds of jobs. I mean, BBC, it went from engineering, uh, you know, through production, administration, um, and there were very different kinds of departments with very different needs and activities. So you got a chance, I found, particularly when I was young, and the organization was, was good at that, was you could move around doing what were called attachments to various departments. I found that hugely useful because it either confirmed that, um, you know, the great suspicion that everybody else was having a much better time than you, uh, and then you discovered, oh, no, they weren't. They had the same problems. Um, or else it gave you the idea that, yes, I'd really like to do that rather than what I'm doing. So I went from local radio after quite a long time and went into television. I was very nervous about it, and I was rather shunted there. Found myself in the journalistic side, which I'd never done before. And I can specifically answer your question that after about two years, and it was two years, of learning the ropes and live on television some of the time, so the viewers suffered, because I was, I really no idea quite what I was supposed to do. I suddenly had a, not quite a road to Damascus moment, but I realized I love doing it. I turned up in the morning going, what next? I can specifically remember, I got to that point which I talked about, where you felt you were in control of it. You could do it. You could rise to the occasion. I was very nervous in the first couple of years because everything came at you from, you know, sort of pools winners to cabinet ministers to dog shows. And you wondered whether you could get your head round it, do a good job. And I, it took me two full years of work before suddenly I realized I was up to speed. And I knew how, the techniques of how to cope with it. And from that point onwards, I said, whoopee. And I decided this was where I wanted to stay. And I stayed in it, particularly in the 80s, under pressure. Because time and again, people came and said, would you like to go into management? Actually, it, it's not a hard question to answer in the BBC once you've seen the management of the BBC. I mean, it's a, it's a, and I, it, it was a kind of siren voice because particularly in the 80s, people were thinking management was the new science and you went into management. But I knew I wasn't a management animal. I was the sort of person who was always asked, asked to leave meetings having caused trouble. I knew that wasn't my milieu, wasn't my thing. And paperwork, I mean, journalists, I mean, you know, I, we were hopeless at it. I mean, our expenses for a four-week trip somewhere used to be a sm small, soiled bunch of receipts, usually for things involving drink. <laughs> uh, and and, and I, it's not my thing. I don't do that sort of thing side very well. So I knew, and I knew I was, as it were, riding a horse that it frightened me to begin with but it had got up to speed. I thought you stay on this horse because I loved it. It took me quite a long time to get there and I had to get to that point where I knew I could do it. That's why I stayed. 
spent a decade living and working in the States, come back here recently, and uh, one of the things that struck me from that time was uh, America's a great country, I thoroughly enjoyed myself there, but the chance to benchmark many of the things that we do in this country has taught me how incredibly well we do do many things in the UK, and yet, of course, our huge problem is our a lack of belief in ourselves as a country, and our glass is half empty attitude, and the contribution of the media, particularly printed media, to that. I just wondered if you had any comments on that. Uh, yeah, it is. I, I'm not, for all that I say that you should have a belief in yourself, it's not that messianic one which I encounter in the southern states of, the, uh, uh, of America, where, where people, you, you only have to spend 15 minutes in an American airport to find yourself in front of the, the shop that is selling how to be the next president of the United States. You know, 214 pages of absolute rubbish. Um, and there's a gap between what I call that kind of sense of, I can do it, I can do anything, um, to what I'm suggesting, which is that you pull out of yourself your own experience, your own sort of um, recognition of your strengths and weaknesses. I think that's usually, I mean, I am frightened. I hate insects. What has this got to do with things? I used to avoid certain sort of decisions in places in countries where they have very big insects. <laughs> I used to actually recognize my weakness that I was going to spend no time asleep at night. I'd be rigid on the ground going, it's going to come soon. <laughs> and I'd get no sleep and I'd be knackered the next morning. I recognize my weaknesses and I actually factor it in to how I make decisions and see if I can get round it, you know, compensate for it, or I just avoid it altogether. I'm not a believer that anybody can do anything. I think you pull it out of yourself. And you, you pull it from your background, your own experience, you sort of add it in and you, you then say, come on, I can do it. And the other thing is that um, it, it is a real sort of feature of society in the States that people you know, are also s suggested that they head for success. What I find grim about it is there is a downside that if you haven't made it you're nothing that i find is the non-humane side of the attitude which merely suggests that the only people who are worthwhile are those who are classified by others in terms of a specific kind of peer group success or a kind of a national kind of success i i don't buy that i think it leads to a hungry society, forever hungry for what's on somebody else's plate, and a sense of lack of appreciation for people who live quiet lives, ordered lives, orderly lives, within their own parameters. I believe that you should get to the level which you want and which you can rise to, which you are happy to. I believe enormously in being a happy human being. I mean, you can't define happiness. I have government departments being paid enormous salaries to define this now, but I actually think you can't define it, but you know within yourself. You know within yourself. And that you live a life that you think you are doing something decent, etc. That, to me, is believing in yourself rather than that much sort of more public one where you've always got to be picked out, lauded, highlighted, in the spotlight, you know, uh, and that is the only success around. Because the moment you actually concentrate on that, you say, well, what happens to everyone else? Um, be happy in yourselves. That's my thought. Um, it sounds trite. Yeah, but just don't buy those books and those airports. They're rubbish. <laughs> Thank you. I'd now like to open our awards ceremony and start by presenting our postgraduate certificate in professional practice awards. We recently have a record number of graduates from the programme, 18. And today we have six who will be graduating with us and 10 in absentia. Two more will graduate at the annual lecture. 
This is an opportunity for us to congratulate our colleagues and to share their success. The Postgraduate Certificate forms a key part of our professional development programme. It's an opportunity for those working within higher education to pursue the programme to and in doing so to recognise their knowledge and their experience. The award is designed to help individuals rise to the challenge that's, that we face in the sector and to fill their, fulfil their potential. I'm pleased, therefore, to present the AUA Postgraduate Certificate in Professional Practice Award to the following graduates. <coughs> Alison Chapman. Claire Henderson. <laughs> Beverly Matthews. Gwenda Palmer. <laughs> Lee Standen. and Daniel West. <laughs> they can't be with us today, but we want to recognize the achievements of these colleagues. Rowena Armstrong, Kevin Carroll, Joanne Ennis, Jennifer Geary, Lucy Hemming, Radka Newton, Maria Poole, Naomi Simcox, Jill Walsh, and David Watson. We now move to our Fellowship Awards. The AUA Fellowship Award is designed to recognise the contribution of AUA members to the work and development of our association and also to the development of the higher education sector as a whole. Contributions to their working environment. Fellowship recognises many different diverse activities colleagues who are network coordinators, authors of articles for Perspectives news links, postgraduate certificate mentors, the presenters of uh, working sessions, plenary sessions at our conferences, one day events, branch events. I'd now like to call upon two colleagues who've demonstrated their contribution and are receiving fellowship today. First of all, Anne Craven. <laughs> and secondly, Nigel Phillips. Colleagues, our plenary has drawn to a close. 
I can honestly say that this plenary has been packed with prestige, personality and passion. Uh, colleagues, one last chance to thank our plenary speaker, Kate Avery.